And here we are back and the second part of putting together this fantastic, although I am slightly biased, crimson kit guitar. Now, despite the fact that the boys have <laughs> gone uh, above and beyond in sanding this, uh, it's in, uh, it, it came out of, out of the box. It was delivered to me in an almost perfectly sanded state already. Uh, up to about 150 grit using the, the fantastic Mercus uh, random or sander. But uh, there is always uh, fine sanding to do on any guitar build. And uh, yeah, here we go. <sighs> I'm quite enjoying sanding today, actually. <sighs> okay. Stain. Stain time. Time to stain. You are a stain. I am not. Okay, we have phthalo blue. We have orange. And uh, those two mixed together are going to make a rather interesting, well, not mixed together. This is a double stain. In other words, I'm gonna put a base of the blue on uh, let it dry a little bit, rub it back a little bit, and then I'm going to put orange over that, and uh, we're going to be wowed. <clears throat> I hope. If that doesn't work, then we'll sand it back and do something else. Everything is an experiment, and uh, the fact that I'm being filmed doesn't change that fact. I've not messed around with a a blue-based stain before. I love this colour. It is a lovely colour. Who, who could blame you? It's also at this stage where we will see <laughs> if I've missed any scratches anywhere. Which is always entirely possible. The step that I've missed at this stage is uh, on all of the guitars that we make crimson before we stain, we tend to damp it down with a, a damp rag, not a wet rag, and uh, then let it dry and that raises the grain a little bit. And uh, then we sand down to an even higher grit, damp it again, raise the grain, sand it down. And after a couple of uh, runs through like that, the grain stops raising and you've got a perfect, perfectly sanded finish that won't raise when you put stain on. Um, now these, these stains here are water-based and they will raise the grain uh, unless you do that. Notice that spot on the end of the headstock. I didn't notice that until the camera person leaned in and just whispered in my ear at this point. I said, Oi, you've got a spot that you've missed. There we go. Sorted. This bit often gets missed. Okay, we have blue. I'm gonna go back to my 320 grit paper. You can go finer if you want, 400, 600. I wouldn't really suggest going any finer than that. And uh, I'm just going to just take the top off. This is a water-based stain. I just said that. And uh, it raises the grain just a little bit, depending on how well you've sanded it. It'll raise the grain sand it back a little bit, that pushes the grain back. If you aren't going to do a double stain like this and you don't want to go through this process, then, and this applies to all sorts of finishes actually, uh, you want to damp down your wood beforehand 
and sand it as part of the sanding process. And that gets you a much, much better uh, base for any finish that you want. Uh, I've avoided that this time because I knew I was gonna be sanding down in between stain coats. This is also giving me a little bit more variation in color. That's gonna make it just a little bit more interesting in the end. Well, he's just repeating what I've just said to you. So, I don't know, he's trying to take my limelight or something like that, really. <sighs> Prove his superior knowledge. I'm starting to get more and more worried about the levels of dust. It's a little bit too light there. Yeah, restone. Just go back. The, the main issue I have is that I am on camera all the time. Uh, I should wear masks more. And when I'm just building for myself, or when I'm not being filmed, I do wear dust masks more often and I have air filters and things going. But, um, yeah, dust is not your friend. It kind of looks like I'm wearing two gloves. I probably should be wearing two gloves. Okay, live and learn. The reason why I was only wearing one glove is because uh, as I'm sanding down, I like to f feel what I've done. The moment of truth. A moment of truth. Now, one of the beautiful things about our stains is uh, they are completely mixable. We can do anything we want. They, they compatible. The word is compatible, and I'm just stumbling here and coming across as an unprofessional voiceover guy, and that's just, I, I can't work under these circumstances, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're fully compatible with each other, and you can adjust the, the finishes and adjust the, uh, the look with ease. Um, it doesn't penetrate too deeply into the wood so you can sand right back if necessary without too much damage or any damage really. Um, but also I could go back over this with just water on a rag and uh, pull the color back a little bit if required. but uh, what I'm after is a darker sort of look to match in with the, the black body. And uh, in fact, my first inclination was to burn the neck as well, but uh, I decided not to. It's a little bit more monochrome than I was hoping for. This is, uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the, uh, the variation of a flame maple chunk of wood. But that's not an issue. Okay. Bring on the cherry red.
and this is where we see layer upon layer can really have an effect. And it's also fairly easy to do a burst type effect as well, by hand. Yeah, that didn't look good, did it? We need to let this dry before we put finish on. But you will see it absolutely pop underneath an oil finish in a minute. I'm just rubbing any excess off. This burnishes the surface up a little bit, makes it smoother, more comfortable to play. We'll be back. We'll leave this here for a little while, go and put some oil on another on the body, and uh, come back later to apply oil to this beastie. And, uh, and we'll see how that turns out. In general, I would actually leave it for longer than just a little while, a day or two, to properly dry before the oil goes on. But, uh, well, look at that. Thin coats, lightly applied, burnishing as we go, taking away the excess as well. Now because we've got the, uh, the stain on there and we've essentially rubbed down the grain, it's not penetrating as deeply as uh, it would on raw wood. But that is 1500 grit, wet and dry paper, uh, or even higher, and you put the oil on and uh, use the sandpaper to, uh, to basically buff the oil deep into the grain. It fills any issues that you have on open poured grain. Okay. But also gives a much smoother finish. I'm gonna buff this down, make sure it's got no wet oil left on it, and then leave it to cure. And it needs two or three more coats of oil at least but uh, I'll have to uh, put those on over a, uh, over a couple of days, really, in order to get the best results. But you can already see what this uh, instrument is gonna look like. I'm not sure if I did that. I think I did. And in this case, the kit guitar, I'm going to be engraving, uh, not the Crimson Guitars logo, I'm going to do my own little sigil thing on here because it's, well, it's not a Crimson guitar, it's a Crimson kit. There's a fine line, the kits are made by the same guys that made the guitars just put together by somebody else. You. It's put together by you. So this has had just the one rather extensive coat of oil. And it's only taking a little bit 
of soot away with it. So we'll, we've already sealed away a lot. If I, for example, go like that, <laughs> that's what it was like before. So uh, yeah, more oil. Crimson Guitar's guitar finishing oil is designed to penetrate and uh, even on the second coat that was penetrating quite a lot. I'll leave it to cure for another five or ten minutes. The length of time depends on how warm it is in the environment that you're in uh, and uh, it's relatively cool in here so that's curing a little bit slower. So uh, yeah, I'll leave that and then rub all the excess off. I'm gonna go wash my hands and put my hat somewhere because it's uh, too warm to be wearing a hat, to be fair. Very pretty. The hat was on the peg that the guitar is on, which is why I had to put the hat on to put the guitar on. The magic yeah. appearing hat of awesomeness. I look good in that hat, <laughs> he says. I really feel like taking up screen printing. Isn't that awesome? It's like the guitar is photocopying its butt. This is a fairly standard T-type. <clears throat> In other words, you can, buy, you can buy anything you want that will fit on this instrument. I... One of the reasons why I enjoy uh, the idea of kit builds, though, is that you can do pretty much anything you want. And uh, it's, a, it's a relatively easy, relatively inexpensive way to build your dream Teddy-type guitar. Um, S-type, whatever, Les Paul. LP-type. I'm, I'm second-guessing myself from a legal standpoint here. Um, but anyway, you know, we're going to be producing a lot of different instruments that are based on fantastic vintage guitars of the past and uh, you can take that and build whatever you want. I'm not going to put a standard scratch plate on this instrument because that would be boring. And I am currently in the second wind of my copper period, so I am now on camera with you, dear Vila. Is that a little bit too formal? Are we beyond the formal stage in our relationship? Uh, I'm going to make a, a patterned copper scratch plate and control plate because that black mixed with sort of electric blues and browns and things is just going to, should just look stunning. And, uh, and that's all the excuse I need. I fancy it. So, uh, let's go. I need some copper. This being backwards is going to annoy a whole load of people. That's going to amuse me no end. Uh, okay, I have several options. I have several options. Let's do it by hand. I'm going to at least start this by hand. I might finish it on a uh, saw, but... Uh... Oh, 
I'm just sitting here waiting for that blade to break. Now, I'm cutting very, very, very close to the line. Uh, the, the less filing and fixing we have, uh, the better. That was like insane to watch. Eighteen seventies Miller's Fault. Fantastic drill. Check out the vintagetool.com for my side business. <laughs> Wow, that's a flexible drill bit. There's a uh, cam on the top of that saw there that I've taped so that it can't be used as a cam anymore. And uh, that is for a very good reason. The last time I snapped a blade while the cam was untaped, the cam smashed up and uh, punched me in the face and uh, that annoyed me. It's also not necessary, really. I just really enjoy watching that cut that fast. Do you know what? The plastic's getting in my way. The time has come to pull off the wrap. Come on. It doesn't want to come. There we go. Those of you wearing headphones, this is for you. It's a good noise. That's, it's a good noise, isn't it? Indeed. It's that new stuff. Noise. I could have taken this off before when it was square and easy, but I like the big reveal too much. It's a, it's a weakness. <laughs> it's almost tempting just to leave it. Almost. Okay. Leveling fast really are rather useful in a myriad of different places and uh, for a myriad of different jobs, really. Myriad, word of the day. Now I'm just tidying up the edges. We don't want any sharp edges, we don't want any variation really. A little bit of sanding, a little bit of filing. And uh, yeah, here we go. And we go through the whole process again. three-way blade switch. I'm using a three-way toggle 
evil reasons. This time drilling through the Triton. I do love my Miller's Falls, but uh, sometimes you need that extra hand to hold what you're working on. Step drills are absolutely amazing. If you're doing any sort of scratch blade making or working with any sheet material, um, and for many other options, I use them for, uh, for jack sockets, jack holes at least, often. Uh, but yeah, if you don't have a step drill, get yourself one, a good one. Yeah, watching this at speed thinking, that, that man's gonna take his fingers off. There's a faster way. Just use the step drill from the other side. Ooh. Okay, we have moved to engineering and uh, this is right out the back. I would normally do this outside, but uh, it's currently dark out there and we can't film in the dark. So I'm going to play around with ammonia, put this in here, use salt, some mustard, bits and pieces, and then an ammonia solution. And then I'm gonna leave it for a couple of days. Uh, I will, when the filming is stopped, run away out of this room and move this somewhere a little bit less toxic to my stuff. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have a couple of bits and pieces that need some fantastic effect. And uh, well, let's do that now then. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of this before my mask goes on. I.e. I'm gonna do the bits and pieces before the ammonia. Coleman's mustard, this stuff is excellent. And uh, I like the sort of colour that you get with it. Mustards give you a reds and browns. Actually, it turns out I need to put my mask on just because of the mustard. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I laughed at myself twice there. That's insane. I'm so sorry. I'm actually okay. embarrassed. These are the two ingredients that we're going to use the most of today. Commons mustard and table salt. and I need to buy my sister some more salt and probably a new salt shaker. Okay, I'm gonna put the mask on and uh, uh, put in some ammonia. Watch the mustard start to turn red. Now just dripping this on really isn't cutting the mustard. Oh no. <sighs> oh, forgive me. There we go. The mustard started to turn bright red, which is an almost immediate reaction. That's awesome. Uh, now, oh, and then you can see the salt up in that pickup cavity started to turn blue. And those two colors, along with the copper itself, um, are awesome. Now this ammonia is a lot 
more dilute than when it first came to me. So I'm just throwing it on there. There we go. I'm not sure what that moan was. Um, yeah, so just throw it on there. But uh, when it's fresh and new, it's a lot stronger and you don't need quite so much. Thank you for watching. I'd really appreciate it. Please click like, please subscribe, and don't forget to come back for the next video, coming soon. Also, you, if you're watching this before the end of 2017, can win this guitar. It can be yours. See the description below for details of how to win, or at least enter the competition. Goodbye. Wow, he looks weird. Oh my gosh. When did I do that? Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs> See you later. Bye.